143rd commencement of Boston University is now in order. Please rise for the national anthem to be led by Ms. Denise Ward, who is graduating with his, her bachelor's degree in music from the College of Fine Arts. Following the anthem, please remain standing for the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by Mary Elizabeth Moore, Dean of the School of Theology. Thereafter, President Brown will preside over the ceremonies. May the spirit of holy wonder fill this place. On this eve of tomorrow, look to your left and look to your right. You are beautiful. <laughs> you are each unique, and you are part of the unique class of 2016. Yes. Yet you gather on this common ground of Boston University touched by Howard Thurman's vision of common ground for all peoples, living in the city of the Boston Common, alongside the River of Charles, sparkling waters linking land and sea, under the vast sky that stretches across our planet and far beyond. On this eve of tomorrow, we celebrate you. And we hold in memory a Boston University graduate of 2015, Father Vincent Machosi, who returned home to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to work for a just and peaceful nation. Documenting human rights violations, serving as priest and teacher, and gathering leaders who were passionate for justice. On the eve of March 20, 12 military gunmen found him in his home village and killed him in a hail of bullets. His last words were, why are you killing? On this eve of tomorrow, we pray for no more killing, no more injustice. We pray for peace. On this eve of tomorrow, we gather as Jews, Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, agnostics, atheists, and humanists, yet we all no wonder, the wonder of discovery, the wonder of the unknown, holy wonder. And we all know some measure of compassion and justice. We know it when we see it, and we know it when we don't. You graduates, 
have the spirit and power to make better tomorrows. May wonder travel with you as you travel into new commons, new days, and may your lives be marked by compassion and justice. Amen. Please be seated. Good afternoon and welcome to Boston University's commencement exercises. It is a pleasure to welcome the graduates and their guests and also to welcome those of you who are joining us via broadcast on the radio and on the internet. I now present Ms. Deborah Marcus, a senior who will receive her bachelor's degree from the College of Arts and Sciences. She will speak on behalf of the class of 2016. Ms. Marcus. President Brown, trustees, faculty, and the class of 2016. It would be easy for this speech to feel generic to the point where it could be inserted into the commencement proceedings of any college and fit perfectly. I could talk about the nervousness we all felt upon arriving here, the dining hall food, the struggle of learning how to do laundry, the well-worn list is pretty long, and all of that would be relevant and valid, and it would be a good speech. But, but it wouldn't come close to doing justice to the experience of being a Boston University student. <laughs> Thank you. A few months ago, a friend of my mother's asked me to speak to her daughter, a high school sophomore, about college admissions and the college experience in general. We met at a Dunkin' Donuts. Where else could I go as a Boston resident? And she asked me if I liked my school, if I had made friends, if I was happy there and I found myself choked up, and I said yes. But how do you distill what it means to get a BU education into a half hour conversation over a latte? How was I supposed to describe the rush of excitement of waking up every day in a city I adore? where I hope to live for the rest of my life. How could I possibly encapsulate the intellectual vitality of my friends and my professors and the very air on this campus? There are some things you can only really understand by living them. Being a BU student is one of those things. And that is the experience we all share, that we are here today to celebrate. Before I continue, I have a confession. I am a transfer student. <laughs> I came here in the spring of my sophomore year. I never was a BU freshman. Some of you, may now be concerned that a person who only amounts to five-eighths of a terrier <laughs> is your commencement representative. But though my BU experience was somewhat condensed, this school has utterly reshaped who I am. And I think it's reasonable to say that no matter how much time we've spent here, 
we have all, in some way, been transformed. So how did BU transform me? BU transformed me by offering a class on music and civil rights that expanded my worldview to include entire generations of activists and songs I had never heard of or thought about. BU transformed me by letting me be a first year student outreach project staff member <laughs> and welcome new students to this school and this city just as I was welcomed two and a half years ago. BU transformed me by putting me in a place where I could befriend people from the Middle East, from the West Coast, from South America, all of us from different starting points, but gathered here, right here, to exchange ideas for our mutual betterment. How did BU transform all of us? Through our academics, we were exposed to more than just our own lived experiences and to mindsets we may have otherwise never encountered. Through extracurriculars, we were able to explore things that weren't initially our goals, but that became our passions and our loves. Through conversations with people from all backgrounds, we could nurture our ability to be kind, to listen, to start to understand those different from ourselves. We will walk out of here today as graduates of one of the few universities in the nation with cadaver labs for undergraduates. <laughs> A school with undoubtedly the swankiest two-story dining hall there is. A university with a staggering variety of people and perspectives, all connected by a mutual love of and pride in this school. Being at BU meant feeling like I belonged, not just among my particular circle of friends, but with everyone I met here. I felt supported and cared for. And that has fundamentally changed who I am and how I approach the world. I can tell you with confidence, I have absolutely no idea what the future will bring. <laughs> I would not have predicted that I would end up here. But BU has given all of us a tremendous arsenal of skills and tools that reach beyond just academic knowledge. And that means, no matter what, we are prepared to move forward. And we will continue to grow, to redefine our identities, to improve the lives of those around us, because that is how BU has transformed us. We have learned how to be our best selves. I hope that your lives bring you unexpected joys. I hope that each of you thrives in all of your pursuits. And I hope that one day, in 10, 20, 50 years, you too will have the opportunity to tell a dedicated, motivated, knowledge-hungry, aspiring terrier what it meant to you to attend Boston University. Class of 2016, thank you, and congratulations. Thank you, Ms. Marcus. I would now like to call upon Monica Meiderman Rodriguez, a graduating senior from the College of Communication and Juliana Zeta Freeman, a graduating senior from the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you, President Brown. 
As civil rights leader and alumnus, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Throughout our four years here at Boston University, each and every one of us has come alive and thrived due to the many contributions made to this community, both inside and outside the classroom. Today, as we become BU alumni, we must think back on what and whom have contributed to making BU our home. Both through academics and extracurriculars, we have formed bonds and friendships with mentors, professors, and each other that will last forever. Over the course of our senior year, we set out to answer Dr. King's question and figure out how we, as a class, could give back to BU. Thanks to the generous donors to the BU Class Gift Campaign, we hope to help this university continue to provide amazing opportunities and memories for future Terriers. You all gave to individual funds, like the Liu Ling Zhu Scholarship, the Community Service Center, I Chase the Care, your individual schools and colleges, and my personal favorite, BU on Broadway. <laughs> With 2,705 participants, the 2016 BU Class Gift Campaign was the most successful campaign in Boston University's history. We would like to thank the Class of 2016 for your incredible generosity. We would also like to thank our very dedicated board and committee members, as well as our immensely supportive supervisors. As we set out to start the next chapter of our lives as alumni of this wonderful university, we will continue to cont contribute our time and resources to making an even better BU. President Brown, on behalf of Boston University's newest alumni, I would like to uh, announce the class gift of $95,000. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Meiderman Rodriguez and Ms. Freeman. And thank you, the class of 2016. The class gift is a tangible expression of your commitment to Boston University. This commitment began when you first enrolled as students and is confirmed today as you move into the ranks of alumni. In the life of a university, faculty come and go, presidents come and go, but alumni are its constant, the unending link of its past, present, and future. I am now pleased to present Wayne Positon, president of the Boston University Alumni Council, who will speak to you on behalf of the Alumni Association. Mr. Positon. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Congratulations, class of 2016. On behalf of your fellow 312,000 alumni, I offer you a well-earned congratulations on the completion of your degrees. And to your parents, family members, and significant others here with you today, we thank you as well for all the support you have provided to them. Today, you have completed one journey, and you now embark on another. Being from New Jersey, I would remiss in not offering you some sage advice. Go Jersey from two fellow Jerseyans to help you on your journey. First, a bit of a paraphrase from a John Bond song. It's your life. It's now or never. We're not going to live forever. Just make sure you live when you're alive. So many challenges lie ahead for all of us. One thing to make sure when you go on that journey is to always take a little time to enjoy that life. Secondly, and I've tried to follow this as much as I can, you all know what Yogi Berra said. If you come to a fork in the road, take it. Absolutely infallible advice. Today, on behalf of all those terriers who have come before you, I welcome you to your alumni association. Our alumni live in 185 countries around the world. In today's world of social media, 230,000 of them are on LinkedIn. 73,000 follow Facebook. So always remember, you're only a click away from another terrier. You have all witnessed with me the incredible transformative uplift 
of Boston University under the great leadership of Dr. Brown and the Board of Trustees. You have joined with your record-breaking class gift in achieving the incredible success that we have experienced with the continuing capital campaign. We are all truly proud of what we see and feel going on at BU. An old New England saying comes to mind, a rising tide lifts all boats. Every one of us feels that pride at BU in the value of the education and relationships we have made here. When you come back in 2017, you will be the first class of alumni to be welcomed to the new Alumni Center in the 101-year-old castle, another long thought about pipe dream that will now become a reality. I like to say that people should never forget where they came from. That applies to us together as alumni. You will take a variety of paths from here, some to graduate school, some to jobs, some to other forms of service. With that success comes responsibility. Responsibility to your families, your communities, and yes, to where you came from, Boston University. The BU Alumni Association will be there to help you. Some 50,000 BU alums have gathered in the last year more than 900 times, nearly three times a day throughout the world. Stay involved, participate, be there to do your part in contributing to the continuing success that all of us share as an important part of the Boston University community and in making sure that others who follow have that same opportunity. As you move forward, you will find that many people look back to their college years and say, well, that was the best four years of my life. I know differently. This is not an end, it's a beginning. You will have the opportunity to make a real difference in this challenging world that we all live in. We know you will make the most of it. Or as another New Jerseyan from Hoboken said, the best is yet to come. Go for it, be you, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Positon. Teaching is an art. It is also one of the most important functions of the university and it help, as it helps to mold the next generation of informed citizens and creative thinkers, many of whom are here today. The late Dr. Arthur G.B. Metcalf, an alumnus, faculty member, and trustee, founded and endowed the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching at Boston University to recognize great practitioners of this art. Candidates for the award are nominated by members of the Boston University community and a committee of faculty and students then submits its recommendations to the university provost and to me. It is indeed difficult to select a winner of the Metcalf Cup and Prize because all of the candidates are outstanding. Two finalists in the competition will receive the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Ann Cudd, please present the winner of the 2016 Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. President Brown, I have the honor to present Manor Jarawala, winner of the 2016 Metcalf Award. A lecturer in the Department of Physics since 2007, Dr. Manher Jarawala is a nationally recognized leader in the study, improvement, and advancement of physics education at all levels. He is prolific in his contribution to literature in the field and widely honored for his gifts as an educator. At Boston University, his pedagogical innovation has had significant far reaching impact. Based on cognitive research findings that students learn better by doing than by watching, he has transformed introductory physics into an interactive experience that engages students. Through his learning assistant program, he has pioneered the use of students as partners in science, technology, engineering, and math education. And as part of his responsibilities in training graduate teaching fellows, he's initiated the Teaching as Research Fellowship Program. Dr. Jarawala's innovative methods are, in the words of a colleague, transforming how students learn at BU. In the words of students, he is enthusiastic and friendly, 
with the ability to simplify subjects and explain them to anyone. It is not unusual for students to praise him as their favorite or best professor. Dr. Jarawala's commitment to education is inspiring and his results exemplary. Boston University is proud to present Dr. Manher Jarawala with the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Ann Cudd, please present the winner of the 2016 Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. President Brown, I have the honor to present Aaron Murphy, winner of the 2016 Metcalf Award. For over a decade, Dr. Aaron Murphy has brightened the university with a combination of enthusiasm and innovation as a pro professor of English and women's gender and sexuality studies. She is a strong proponent of student participation, and her classes are known for lively discussion in the introduction of new methods of learning, including the use of live performance, film, and new media in the study of literature. Dr. Murphy also has shown remarkable versatility, teaching 16 different courses while at BU, ranging from an introduction to Shakespeare for non-majors to the theoretical formations of family and kinship. Her groundbreaking graduate seminar on gender and sexuality has become almost legendary for its scope, ambition, appeal to students from across schools and disciplines. Students describe Dr. Murphy's classroom as a charged intellectual atmosphere. Her courses as challenging, re rewarding, and surprisingly enjoyable. And her enthusiasm as infectious and inspiring. A colleague sums up her value to the university thus. I can turn the page. Creative, resourceful, and generous. She does not just teach great classes, she strengthens the educational environment at BU. A gifted scholar and educator, Professor Murphy unlocks the considerable joys of learning to help create new generations of outstanding scholars and professionals. For this, Boston University proudly presents Dr. Aaron Murphy with the Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching. Will Dean Sandro Galea of the School of Public Health present the winner of the 2016 Metcalf Cupman Prize for Excellence in Teaching? President Brown, I have the honor to present Christopher Gill, winner of the 2016 Metcalf Cup and Prize. <laughs> Dr. Christopher Gill began teaching international health at Boston University in 2002. Took a professional hiatus at Novartis Vaccines and Diagnostics from 2008 to 2010 and returned to BU in 2011. The hiatus was critical for one of Dr. Gill's foremost gifts is his unique ability to blend his pharmaceutical expertise into his courses. This gift is most prominently on display in his innovative course, Clinical Development of a New Medicinal, a living simulation where students compete and collaborate to take a vaccine from basic science to regulatory approval. The course reflects Dr. Gill's creative approach and commitment to the practical, academ uh, practical application of academic learning. But it barely scratches the surface of Dr. Gill's prolific contributions to BU. He has been recognized by colleagues at the School of Pel Public Health with numerous awards for his superior teaching, innovative course design, and mentoring of students. Students praise a dynamic, enthusiastic, and available professor with a great grasp of the subject matter who prompts deep, critical thinking. 
prodigiously published in demand as a peer reviewer and leader of four funded research projects, Dr. Gill nonetheless places a priority on teaching that is inspired and inspiring. Boston University is honored to present Dr. Christopher Gill with the university's highest teaching award, the Metcalf Cup and Prize for Excellence in Teaching. We now present the candidates for the, honorary, the university's honorary degree. Will trustees Carla Meyer and Stuart Pratt escort our honored guests to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Meyer. Mr. President, it is my honor to present Carrie Hessler Radlett for Boston University's honorary degree. 30. Thirty-five years ago, a recent graduate of Boston University, seeking a purpose in life, sat down for a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her grandmother. The world got lucky that day. The grandmother was a former Peace Corps volunteer, and the young BU graduate was you. Thus began a long career of commitment to helping people in need around the world. It wasn't long before you yourself were a volunteer in far off Western Samoa, teaching school and launching a public awareness campaign for disaster preparedness. You worked with the Special Olympics in the Gambia. You helped expand educational opportunities for girls around the world and dispatched doctors and nurses to developing countries. You promoted global awareness and expanded treatment of HIV AIDS in advanced maternal and child health. In short, you helped humanity. You made the world a better place. Now the circle is complete. You returned to the Peace Corps in 2010 and were sworn in as director in 2014. You've improved the safety and security of volunteers and attracted a record-breaking number of applications. The organization is thriving. One of America's best ideas has become even better because of your devoted stewardship. Carrie Hester Radlett, your humane and selfless actions inspire us to look beyond ourselves to a greater good. Boston University is proud to call you an alumna and to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Laws, Honors Causa. Will trustees Kenneth Mingus and Ryan Roth Gallo escort our honored guests to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Mingus. We have the honor to present the Honorable Ernest Moniz for Boston University's honorary degree. It is the stuff of the American dream. The grandson of Portuguese immigrants and the son of a tire factory worker. You come from modest means, but great aspirations. With perseverance and brains, you have plumbed the secrets of the universe, earned through your research and teaching the wisdom and stature that has made you worthy of the immense responsibility you now shoulder as Secretary of Energy. Your accomplishments are both prolific and prodigious. As a student, you graduated from Boston College, summa cum laude, and earned a PhD in theoretical physics from Stanford. As head of the Bates, <laughs> as head of the Bates Linear Accelerator Center at MIT, you have expanded our knowledge of how the universe works. As a professor at MIT, you have prepared and inspired a generation of scientists who have gone on to make their own significant contributions. 
As a superbly knowledgeable negotiator, you've shaped the details of the nuclear accord with Iran and secured Russian nuclear materials. Serving Serving under two presidents, you have been responsible for such critical matters as fostering global security and protecting the environment. And you've been knighted by the president of Portugal. Not bad for a kid from Fall River, Massachusetts. <laughs> Ernest Moniz, you have made the world safer, smarter, and better. We and future generations owe you a great debt, perhaps greater than we are yet aware. As a show of our gratitude, respect, and admiration, Boston University is proud to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Law Honoris Causa. Will trustees Ronald Garricks and John Howe escort our honored guests to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Garricks. Mr. President, we have the honor to present Travis Roy for Boston. For Boston University's honorary degree. You came to Boston University as a brilliant hockey talent and a prospective professional. But after 11 seconds on the ice, a spinal cord injury ended your career and left you paralyzed at 20 years of age. No one would have blamed you if you had quit. But there's just one thing you don't know how. <laughs> Instead, you forged ahead with rehabilitation and graduated five years later. Then you did something even more extraordinary. You began helping people. You created a foundation that has raised millions of dollars for research on spinal cord injuries in assistance for the injured. You traveled the country giving motivational speeches that inspired audiences from business titans to children. You've become a prominent voice in the movement to help and heal, offering compelling testimony, including testimony in a United States Senate hearing. Countless lives are better because you wouldn't, couldn't quit. You also brought out the best in us. Your coach and still close friend, Jack Parker, has said that your injury was the worst thing that ever happened to him as coach, but the best is how the Boston University community rallied around you. You may have been on the ice for just 11 seconds, but you were always in our hearts. Your uniform number is retired. Your spirit never will be. Travis Roy, philanthropist, activist, inspiration, and terrier, it is with great pride that we confer upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa. Will trustees Kenneth Feld and Robert Knox escort our honored guests to the podium? Mr. President. Trustee Feld. We are honored to present Nina Tassler for Boston University's honorary degree.
when most of us want to see something better on television, we change the channel. <laughs> you, on the other hand, change television. Not overnight, of course. You grew up dreaming of acting. But then you came to Boston University to study theater, as so many extraordinary actors have. Gina Davis was your roommate. It must have been quite some room to hold that much talent. You both became superstars and friends for life. Your place turned out to be not in front of the camera, but behind the scenes. With almost clairvoyant insight for recognizing and then developing popular programs, you climbed the run, run you climbed run by run to chairman of CBS Entertainment leaving the glass ceiling in shards behind you. You, you succeeded beyond your wildest dreams, but then who could dreamt all this? Your programming has stood the test of time. ER was on the air 15 years, How I Met Your Mother 9, Criminal Minds 11, and counting. And you've kept us on the edge of our seats with the good wife and laughing out loud the Big Bang Theory. You develop blockbuster franchises like CSI and NCIS. You also con generously contributed your time and energy to charities and media organizations and have served your alma mater as a wise and highly knowledgeable trustee. Through it all, you not only raised two children but compiled a luminous book to help others raise empowered daughters. Nina Tassler, you are an exemplar and inspiration, as well as an executive and entertainer. Boston University is proud to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. I now call upon Nina Tassler to deliver the 143rd commencement address of Boston University. Woo. Thank you, President Brown, fellow members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, honored guests, and graduates. Good afternoon. I am so honored to return to my alma mater and share this auspicious day with you. Earlier this year, I was organizing a dinner for new BU parents and alums in the Los Angeles area. So when President Brown called, I assumed he was calling to discuss the menu or schedule for the evening's events. Never in my wildest dreams did I think he was calling to invite me to speak at commencement. I was beyond flattered, confused, and immediately convinced I could come up with a far better choice. <laughs> he politely declined my offer and said, Nina, tell your story. I think your personal journey is inspiring and relatable. Well, I'm not sure how inspiring or relatable my journey has been, but I can guarantee that you are far better prepared to begin your career than I ever was. My passionate ambitions at graduation now seem so unlikely to lead me to where I am today. In coming to speak with you this afternoon, I reflected on the emotional roller coaster I felt when I sat in your seat. But I distinctly recall, first, feeling grateful. Grateful that I had actually graduated and second, terrified, terrified that I had graduated. I suspect you feel the same way. I hope you are grateful to your parents for not just paying your tab at the dugout <laughs> or keeping your Starbucks app filled, but grateful to have arrived at this moment with the love and support of all family and friends many present and sadly long gone, and some long gone, who stood by your side to give thanks and express gratitude on this day and each day going forward to the people who have selflessly helped you and will make you a better, 
happier person. Dealing with the fear I felt and have felt too often since, well, that's a little trickier. It will most likely reveal itself in different forms throughout your life. Be it fear of failure or fear of success, fear of the unknown or fear of rejection or fear of shame. Accepting fear head on is freeing. As my hero Eleanor Roosevelt said, when you have the strength, courage, and conviction to look fear in the face, you are able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. The best antidote to fear is your curiosity, passion, and creativity. The steps you take from this moment on, the same steps I took some 40 years ago, should be, as shared by Erica Jong, to accept fear as a part of life, specifically the fear of change. I have gone ahead despite the pounding in my heart that says, turn back. Embracing change and confronting fear will serve you well. I believe I had embraced elements of that philosophy, but it was my time at BU that gave me the strength to challenge these insecurities. Over the course of my life and career, that frightened voice, that pounding in my heart, has been ever present. Yet I have never turned back. So I hope in sharing my story, there is solace in knowing that fear can be a normal and highly motivating part of your journey. How did I go? How did I go from graduating from BU with a degree in acting? Yes, a degree in acting. <laughs> to becoming the longest running female network chief in the history of broadcast television. <laughs> and, then, and then humbly, what kind of chutzpah does it take to step away from that hard won position and a 30-year career in television to pursue different creative ambitions, devote myself to nonprofit causes, and to publish a book, a collection of essays from mothers in positions of leadership on raising their daughters to be the next generation of empowered women. Ballsy, or so I've been told, crazy too. My ability to assess the situation and reset my career GPS started my first day at BU. When I arrived on campus as a freshman, my father drove me in our faux wood-paneled country squire station wagon from Florida to Boston. We carried my boxes and single suitcase up the stairs of a really nice brownstone at 37 Carlton Street in Brookline. As we walked by the doors looking for my room, I noticed little cut-out flowers made of construction paper on each door. There were names written on each flower. Women's names. Only women's names. I very quickly realized that my dorm was one of the few remaining all-girls dorms on campus. Are you kidding me? This was 1975. By 1973, 30 states had ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. Co-ed dorms were on campuses across the country. I was a dedicated feminist. Our Bodies Ourselves was published in 1971 by the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. What was going on? I made the best of my situation, especially since the rooms were big and we had a private dining room in the basement, which as you can imagine, was fabulous during the bitter Boston winters. Best part of all, the friends and roommates I had while at Brook Hall are some of my best friends to this day. Being at BU in the 70s felt like I was at the epicenter of the universe. Although the College of Fine Arts was an island unto itself and I was enrolled in a conservatory and I was enrolled in, in a conservatory-like curriculum. When I ventured out onto Commonwealth Avenue to other parts of the university, my world exploded. Taking a Holocaust class taught by Elie Wiesel, or listening to lectures by Edward Albee, or even attending a rally protesting tuition hikes where then-President John Silber <laughs> Yeah. 
when then-President John Silber had less than an enthusiastic response to our demands. Whether I knew it then or would come to realize it much later, my goals were shifting, and the person I always felt I was was evolving too. I came to college with one defined goal, to study acting, move to New York, and work on Broadway. Seemed pretty straightforward. The education and training I, I received at BU was world class, but I will also be forever in BU's debt for my husband, fellow alum Jerry Levine. We met as freshmen in 1975 at CFA and married in 1984. While in school together, Jerry hired me as an assistant director on a musical review he was producing. Not only did we experience the thrill of creating something together from nothing, we also fell in love. After 32 years of marriage and two beautiful children, family is still the foundation of our lives. I had chosen a profession, acting, that was rife with rejection. Would I always have the confidence to persevere? My family was unconventional. I'm the daughter of a Jewish father and a Puerto Rican mother. Would I face discrimination and anti-Semitism? I wore my feminism like a badge of honor. After all, BU was the first university to open all its divisions to female students. Would I encounter sexism? And what about my politics? I had been active in political campaigns my whole life. As a kid being enlisted to lick envelopes at the campaign headquarters of Jean McCarthy and George McGovern, would I always maintain my commitment to activism? Would I ever work for a candidate that won? <laughs> thankfully, thankfully the answer to that question and these questions was yes. However, it was not until I moved to Los Angeles and horribly struggled to find work as an actor that the answers to those questions would be revealed. I pounded the pavement to find a job just to pay the bills until my acting career took off. Taking typing tests, poring over the help wanted pages, networking anything, anywhere. My roommate from school and best friend to this day, Gina Davis, again, thank you, BU, set me up on a general meeting with her agent. After that meeting, I thought, hey, I can do this. I can be an agent, unless, at least until my big break as an actor. I knew the questions ask, actors would ask about auditions, acting, and material. I knew how to talk to casting directors, producers, and directors, and writers. After all, I'd been introduced to all of these things in acting school. I finally landed a job as a receptionist. Yep, a receptionist. Getting coffee, handing out bathroom keys, taking phone messages, making photocopies, all the really good stuff. Panic began to rise that this might be the highlight of my show business career, but I desperately tried to exude confidence. Soon after, a friend recommended me to an agent at a large prestigious agency, at the time one of the four biggest agencies in the world. This was a pivotal time in my life and career. I had been preparing, working toward a career as an actor. But here I was with an opportunity of a lifetime that required my abandoning my dream and working toward a new reality. This is when the first major existential crisis hit. If I became an agent, did that mean I had failed as an actor? I found myself learning from some of the most experienced agents in the business and working with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, from Morgan Freeman to Julie Andrews to Bruce Willis. Yet there were still challenges ahead. All over Hollywood, I was exposed to sexist and derogatory language used to describe actresses and female agents. The myth of a casting couch, not a myth after all, but a scandalous reality. My commitment to feminism was pushing me further and further away from a career as an agent. I had increasing doubt about the current state of my so-called career. How was I going to thrive, let alone just survive in a business where sexism, racism, nepotism, narcissism, cronyism, 
and every other nasty ism you can think of had reared its ugly head to me at one time or another. This was the time to persevere, to find a way to fight against the prevailing culture and look for a way to have more influence over the status quo, but insecurity and doubt crept into my psyche. I realized that fear can serve two masters. It can paralyze or motivate. I heard about a job opening at, in development at Warner Brothers Television. I believed I'd be able to access the training, knowledge, and discipline from my training at BU combined with my acquired business and sales experience as a talent agent to pursue what I hoped would be a career-defining opportunity. It would be at Warner Brothers, where I would spend my days in the trenches, listening to writers tell stories, watching actors audition, reading new material, and scouring articles to come up with new ideas for TV shows. Then I got to sell them to one of the five television networks. I loved this process and realized that sometimes the career you end up with has no logical connection to where you began. Witnessing the creative and therapeutic benefits of change was an epiphany. One of my favorite stories from this time was the origin of the longtime hit series ER, which I was fortunate to have been a part of. ER was originally a movie script called EW by Michael Crichton, based on his experiences as a resident. The script was roughly 120 pages long, over 80 speaking parts, and more medical dialogue than you can imagine. The trick was taking this massively dense feature script and turning it into a relatable pilot that would serve as a comprehensive introduction to the medical world and its characters. If not for the genius of writer-producer John Wells, who saw the exquisite literary sculpting of the script and the extraordinary chemistry of the cast, the show might never have seen the light of day. I can still remember when George Clooney, yes, George Clooney, who'd been under a deal with Warner Brothers that had already produced four busted pilots with him, walked into my office, sat down, and questioned me on the fate of the script called ER. He loved the part of Dr. Doug Ross, but he'd been offered a competing project at NBC and worried that ER was dead. There was no way I could assuage his concern for the fate of the project. I shared with him that I had no tea leaves, I had no crystal ball, but had faith in the material and the process. Even George Clooney was scared. ER went on to run for 15 years, becoming the longest running primetime medical drama in American TV history. It won 13 Emmy Awards and received 124 Emmy nominations, which makes it the most nominated drama program in history. Long story short, ER was a huge success and I think George has done just fine. <laughs> the final chapter, or shall I say the most recent phase of my career, has been the most transformative. I joined CBS in 1997 when the network was in last place. In terms of the Hollywood food chain, network television was the big leagues. But I was also essentially starting over again, still making key creative decisions, but as a buyer of content as opposed to being a seller. I was grateful to finally be in the position to push back against the many isms that still plagued our business. I could hire more women. I could hire more people of color and expand a dedicated diversity division, creating programs and opportunities for those historically underrepresented within our industry. Now, all of this was not without risk. The shelf, life for a net, the shelf life for a network executive was legendarily short-lived. I would be judged daily on success or failure based on ratings. The risk of being fired was an absolute daily reality. It was also a bittersweet irony to find myself at the Tiffany Network as my father, who would recently passed away, had been an audio engineer at CBS in 1955. Although he did not live to witness my accomplishment, I have felt him by my side every day. I have made CBS my home for close to 20 years. I began as vice president of drama series development and rose through the ranks to president and ultimately chairman of CBS Entertainment in 2014. I was responsible for the overall management of every day part in the entertainment division. Having been a part of CBS's resurrection as the number one network gives me great pride. Over the years, I've bought and developed some of the most successful shows in television history, 
from CSI to the Big Bang Theory to The Good Wife. Once again, the creative point of origin for these shows is dramatically different from how they will be remembered. Our business is undergoing a seismic transformation from streaming to content creation, delivery systems, multi-platform programming, cord cutting, virtually an entirely new vernacular with an ever-evolving and emerging new revenue model. It's been a revolution, not an evolution. No doubt you will encounter people through the course of your life who will seem to have it all figured out. I know I did. They may even offer you a tutorial on how to walk talk and dress for success. Only half listen. Because each of you, each of you has invested in yourselves. You are chock full of knowledge, but more importantly, you've written an important chapter of your life story. Your wholly unique and personal experience at BU. From living on your own for the first time to relationships and friendships that I hope will last a lifetime to lessons learned and obstacles overcome. We don't know where we'll end up, but making moments matter, making, taking a step back to see something from a different vantage point and investing, investing in your core values can lead to a world of surprises. What, are, what matters most through this whole journey is to quote Gilda Radner, life is about not knowing having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. The odds were stacked well against me. A middle-class Jewish Puerto Rican kid from a quasi-hippie family, a woman finding her way through predominantly male industry, clutching a Bachelor of Fine Arts in a world of folks with law degrees and MBAs, ultimately working in a business where failure is a key factor in the formula for success. It's, it's inconceivable that I should be standing here before you. When I told my mother, who never attended college but worked at the University of Miami's College of Arts and Sciences, that I would be speaking today, we both started crying. On this momentous day, you are starting your next chapter. I really believe it will be a bestseller, a big hit and a critical success. Don't be afraid to edit your dreams and rewrite the story of what you want to do in life. Cherish who you are. And may I leave you with two final thoughts. Kindness does not mean weakness. And you can't make mistakes in your 20s. My sincerest congratulations to each of you in the class of 2016. It is such an honor to be here with you today, and I wish you a beautiful life. Thank you so much. We shall now present the candidates for degrees. Mr. President. Provost Morrison. Mr. President, I have the honor to call for the presentation of the candidates for degrees as recommended by the faculty of Boston University's schools and colleges. To all the candidates for degrees, as your school or college and your degree are called, please rise and remain standing until all the schools and colleges have been called. Mr. President. Professor Delheim. Mr. President, it is an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to present the wonderful students of the Kilachan Honors College Class of 2016.
Mr. President. Dean Moore. Mr. President, with great joy, I present to you the candidates for the Master of Divinity degree, Master of Theological Studies, Master of Sacred Music, and Master of Sacred Theology. Mr. President, with great joy, I also present to you the candidates for our Doctor of Ministry degree, Doctor of Theology degree, and Doctor of Philosophy degree, all recommended enthusiastically by the faculty of the Boston University School of Theology. Mr. President, Dean Hunter. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Science, and Doctor of Science in Dentistry degrees from the recommendation of the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science and Master of Science in Dentistry degrees as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study as recommended by the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. And, Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Dental Medicine degree. Thank you very much. Recommended by, again, the faculty of the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Thank you. Mr. President. Dean Stekicki. Mr. President, I have the honor to recommend the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree in Social Work and Sociology, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Social Work. Mr. President, I have the honor to recommend the candidates for the degree of Masters of Social Work, as recommended by the faculty of the School of Social Work. Mr. President. Dean Galea. Mr. President, I have the honor to recommend candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy and the Doctor of Public Health degree as recommended enthusiastically by the faculty of the School of Public Health. I also have the honor to recommend candidates for the Master of Science and Master of Public Health degree also recommended enthusiastically by the faculty of the School of Public Health. Mr. President. Dean Antman. I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, Masters of Science, and Masters of Arts recommended by the faculty of the School of Medicine. Thank you. Mr. President. Dean O'Rourke. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees Juris Doctor and Master of Laws as voted by the faculty of the School of Law. Mr. President. Dean Upnija. Mr. President, I have the honor to present candidates for the Bachelor's of Science degree as recommended by the faculty of the School of Hospitality Administration. Mr. President. Dean Sladova. I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science, Master of Criminal Justice, Master of Liberal Arts, Masters of City Planning, Master of Urban Affairs, and the Graduate Certificate recommended by the Faculty of Metropolitan College. <laughs> Mr. President, I also have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science, the Bachelor's Liberal Arts, and the undergraduate certificate recommended by the faculty of Metropolitan College. Mr. President. Dean Coleman. I have, I have the honor and privilege to present the candidates for the Doctor of Education, the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Studies in Education, the Master of Arts in Education, the Master's of Education and the Bachelor of Science in Education is recommended by the BU School of Education faculty. Mr. President. Dean Allen. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Musical Arts degree recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts, the Master of Music, 
the Master of Fine Arts, the Artisan Certificate, the Performance Diploma, the Graduate Certificate, and the Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study Degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Music and the Bachelor of Fine Arts degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Fine Arts. <laughs> President Brown, Dean Nisham. Mr. President, I have the great honor and great privilege to present to you the candidates for the Masters of Arts degrees at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies as recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Mr. President, I have the great honor and privilege to present to you the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts degrees in Latin American Studies, Asian Studies, European Studies, Middle East and North African Studies, and in International Relations at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies, as recommended by the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences. Mr. President. Dean Moore. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the, doctor, the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, the Doctor of Physical Therapy, and the Doctor of, doctor of Occupational Therapy degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Science and the Master of Science in Occupational Therapy degrees recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Science degree recommended by the faculty of the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College. Mr. President, Dean Fiedler. Mr. President, I have I have the honor and am delighted to present the candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, Master of Arts, and Master of Fine Arts as recommended by the faculty of the College of Communication. President Brown. Dean Luchin. President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates with a degree of the Doctor of Philosophy as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And President Brown, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degrees of Masters of Engineering and Masters of Science as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. And Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the degree of Bachelors of Science as recommended by the faculty of the College of Engineering. Mr. President, Dean Freeman, Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Science, Master of Business Administration, and Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, recommended by the faculty of the Questrom School of Business. Dean Cudd. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy degree recommended by the faculty of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the candidates for the Master of Arts, Master of Science, and Master of Fine Arts degrees recommended by the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And finally, last but not least, Mr. President, I have the honor and great privilege to present the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts recommended by the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences.
upon the recommendation of the faculty and by the authority of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts given to the trustees of Boston University and entrusted by them to me, I hereby confer upon you the degrees that you have earned together with all appropriate honors, privileges, and responsibilities, in token of which you are granted diplomas. My congratulations to you all. Before you are seated, I would like you to salute your parents. Your accomplishments are built on the support of your family. Please turn to face them and acknowledge once again their role. Please be seated. The commencement ceremony celebrates the achievements of each of our students, but it means much more. It celebrates the accomplishments of a great academic community, a community where you have studied and worked together in classrooms, laboratories, and studios. It celebrates not only your accomplishments, but also the efforts of the faculty and staff whose dedication has helped lead you to this marvelous day. On your shoulders rest the enormous responsibility for guiding America and the world and for addressing the substantial challenges we face. You are the future for this university, for this country, and for our humanity. Among the graduates today are those who are commissioning into the armed services of the United States. You have chosen to dedicate yourselves to the protection of this country. This university is proud of you and gives you its sincerest thanks. Wherever your tours of duty may take you, Godspeed. To the class. To the class of 2016, as you leave Nickerson Field, you join a long line of Boston University graduates st stretching over time to include some 312,000 living alumni of this great institution. Your accomplishments will be part of the fabric of our legacy. Your Boston University education has prepared you. Go into the world and make it a better place for all of us and for all future generations. And again, congratulations and good luck. This is the eighth commencement over which Chairman Knox has presided. In September, he will leave his service on our board after 19 years and eight years as chairman. Because of our term limits, Bob is stepping off the board in handing the chairman's gavel to Kenneth Feld. Chairman Knox has been a wise, diligent, and fa famously affable chairman. His tenure coincides with a period of, in which Boston University has made immense strides in quality and stature. It is not a coincidence. I cherish the privilege today at this podium of expressing our communities Profound gratitude to Bob for his devoted and outstanding service to this great institution. Will you please offer a round of applause to our chairman, Bob Knox. Thank you, Bob. Will all faculty members, graduates, and their guests rise? as Miss Denise Ward leads us in the singing of Cl Clarissima. Words and music may be found on page 105 of your program. Following Cl Clarissima, please remain standing for the benediction.
Reverend Dr. Robert Allen Hill, Dean of Mars Chapel, will now de deliver the benediction. Following the benediction, the 143rd commencement of Boston University will conclude. We ask that all graduates and guests remain at their places until the platform party, the faculty, the, and the Alumni Council have left the stage. Wow. Let us pray. Gracious God of light and love, thou in whose light we see light, Illumine our paths as we depart this place into an unforeseeable future. Thou true light, enlightening every woman and man, be thou a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thou light that shines in the darkness, brighten our difficult days, we pray. Warm our joyful days, we pray. Keep a flame of conscience burning in our hearts all our days, we pray. Keep a flame of hope alive in our culture in these days, we pray. Keep a kindled fire of love burning in the lives of these graduates of 2016, we pray, that we may do all the good we can at all the times we can, in all the places we can, with all the people we can, as long as ever we can. Amen. Mm-hmm.